the short bio is actually a, a sort of euphemism to tell people I don't have a day job. <laughs> but uh, that part, uh, so when Parminder wrote to me uh, a day back saying, Siddharth, I want you to speak something about the structural changes which uh, the digital world has had on our real world. I, 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 I began my train of thoughts with this new book which I read recently. It's called uh, Sapiens, A Brief History of uh, Humankind. Uh, the book has been uh, recommended by none other than uh, Mark Zuckerberg himself. He calls it a seminal book. So I did read it. It's, I mean, as they say, you know, keep your friends close and dot, dot, dot. So then in, in that, the author, uh, his name is Yuval Harari, he makes a very interesting uh, uh, way of narrating human evolution. He says, uh, the way we defeated the Neanderthals, you know, the sapiens defeated the Neanderthals, it's not because we were more intelligent. Intelligent as in the brain size of the Neanderthals was bigger than that of uh, sapiens. They were better built. And how did we wipe them out? So he says that something around 70,000 years ago, we, we developed this thing called myth-making and fiction-making, which became the crux of what changed the world. Harari doesn't say something which is very new. Other people have touched on this topic before, and it has more than a grain of truth in it. Imagine that when we tell each other that there is a God sitting above, it's a creation that we have made a fiction that we have generated and that fiction allows us to govern a huge swath of people in fact i would be killed for saying this in a i don't know in, in bangalore in bangalore right in bangalore itself i'd be killed i don't need to go to saudi arabia i can be killed here uh, so so there is a fiction which has been generated around this uh, called the god there was a fiction which was called the king and his divine right to kingship. It was a fiction which was accepted by the larger population and that helped create a power structure and a society with which ruling went on, exploitation and markets and art, culture and everything went on. Even if we read uh, the, this famous writing by Freud, he talks about totems. You know, there's a book called Totem and Taboo in, in which he points out totems. He says that how did tribes build trust across each uh, across their members or how did they transact so they would uh, they would appoint an animal maybe real maybe mythical and they would say this is our totem we have a totem in india currently called the cow that we assign that okay this is a totem so now see you are a cow child i am a cow child so we are brothers you know and we are the virat uh, brotherhood which will come together and do things and whoever is not a cow child we might as well kill them if not transact with them so there is more than a grain of truth that fictions have led to the formation of power structures in our history. And the present generation or even the post-industrial and now what uh, Anida called the post-modernist, actually we are even worse than that, but that's post-post-modernist. But we also have our own myths, the myth called a company which has rights even if a human being doesn't. The myth which we'll talk about today is the myth which myths which have been built around what is the digital world in general and the internet and its corporations in particular. There are two major myths that surround this uh, industry and this subculture. One is the claim of information technology being a utopia or, or something that's going to lead us to a utopia where everything is very happy and everything is very nice and we are all well fed and there's an app for everything. And using this utopia, there is a claim of exceptionalism which the IT industry, I'll keep referring to the word IT industry, I would like you to understand it as, a, as an amorphous word which encompasses the industry as well as the subculture around it. So the IT industry first sets up this elaborate fiction that it is doing a kind of technology which has never been done before and which will lead us to a utopia unlike anything that you've ever seen. 
and using that it says now that i am going to take you to utopia the ends justify the means therefore i am an exception to common law i am an exception to democratic principles i am an exception to taxation and so on and so forth now what harari says is actually i think the partial truth that fictions build our world it evolves our world yes but what also equally builds our world and is not credited is the manner in which time and again the masses rise and pull these fictions down time and again how people build revolutions and they pull down the myth of the master the white master being superior to the black slave in a plantation the myth that the brahman has been ordained to rule over the dalit who must clean his shit this fiction is pulled down time to time and this too if not more takes our evolution our societal progress our collective knowledge as a society ahead had it not been for the blacks entering the marathon we wouldn't have known that they are such good runners that's knowledge had it not been for the dalit rising up and saying no i am not going to take your nonsense we wouldn't have known that there is something known as universal brotherhood of mankind in the indian context so the, these are equally forms of or uh, rather means this pulling down of fiction is an equal and, and an equally potent means of evolution and the gathering of knowledge which is now equated to information let me uh, try and sort of give you a real life example of how well uh, now no, now that we establish this i would like to progress on to how do we pull those fictions down because it's high time we do that uh, i used to work for a company called uh, dasso systems when i started programming straight out of college and then i and i worked on a software which would allow the user to assemble an entire jumbo jet without actually manufacturing even a single piece you could design every piece you know machine it to perfection and then assemble it together and uh, they did it using the software which i i was one of the developers of that software so what happened is they achieved efficiency a word uh, which my fellow panelist anisha just used you know they achieved massive efficiency in doing they assembled uh, i don't remember which model it was one of the biggest of uh, boeing's uh, aeroplanes which they assembled entirely in virtual reality and we all clapped around in, uh, uh, you know when we were having pizza and uh, I, i don't know some air to drink uh, Yeah, probably probably yes 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 and the boy who must go back to eating uh, uh, rajma i don't know not sorry that's too expensive nowadays uh, bhaji some puri bhaji in in marat in maharashtra you know where i live and work so they did it very efficiently but does it change the fact that boeing still makes money out of bombing the hell out of people's lives it doesn't change that reality i then left that job and i went on to something equally bad if not worse i worked for a company on morgan stanley and uh, i was one of the 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 developers and administrators of this thing they call the stock exchange you know and i would actually see live in front of my computer screens billions of dollars of fake wealth getting traded in a matter of nanoseconds it's called algorithmic trading i think many of you may have heard about it nanoseconds i think they're going even faster than that billions of dollars of wealth would fake wealth would get transmitted from one account to the other that wealth doesn't exist and they say there's 100 trillion or whatever trillion am- amount of debt in the world which gets traded at another 500 trillion but none of that money actually exists so even if done at the speed of uh, nanoseconds at the scale of nanoseconds the wealth remains fake it that doesn't change so let us call out this myth of utopia which the information technology domain has taken on for itself coming more specifically you know like i like i said you know there is a kind of exceptionalism which the it world takes for itself based on these myths i am very good you know i am a very good boy in my studies so i have the right to go do some other nonsense that that's that sort of logic you know so one very famous uh, uh, exceptionalism was the apolitical 
a politicalism, if I may call it, you know. Uh, it's an oxymoron, but it's, it's an ism too, you know. I'm a political. I'm very apolitical. When I was coding in uh, 2004 and all those times, uh, working professionally in those times, I, if I had so much as mentioned that I have a political past, I would probably be called up by my HR guy and said, oh, you're doing something, huh? you better not cut it out. The, there was an apoliticalism. But that apoliticalism lasted only till we had the Aam Aadmi Party come up and the Narendra Modi government come up, uh, the campaign come up. Now, I don't, I, I, I am very close to the Aam Aadmi Party in terms of what they have tried. I participated in what they did. But try and understand what I am saying here, that their apoliticalism lasted only until the point that a certain caste class community came up and participated in politics. They didn't have a problem with apol politics as such. Their apoliticalism was limited. Even now when we go onto the internet and we see the entire legions of fake profiles, trolling and, you know, the sock puppets, uh, the, the, the bots that run, they don't have a problem with politics. They have problem with po politics that doesn't agree with them. So this exceptionalism is really bogus. I see that there are IT firms in uh, all around India which actively participated in the Aadhaar enrollment project. The Aadhaar enrollment project by no stretch of imagination is it an apolitical exercise. It's a political exercise. You are documenting people, you are taking people's data and you are centralizing them and you're going to use them for politics tomorrow. No amount of PR is going to take our eyes off that. But how come the apolitical spaces transform themselves overnight into enrollment centers? Then there is this thing about, you know, trade rights, right? Trade union and labor rights. For a very, for the longest time, to even now, the IT uh, workforce has claimed for itself the idea that we are a meritocracy, a pure meritocracy. So uh, things like labor rights and the things, the, those arcane ideas that you work for eight hours, um, rest for eight hours and pursue your hobbies for the other eight hours from the 24 hours, that doesn't apply to us. We are a pure meritocracy. Really, are you? For every 100 rupees an Indian uh, programmer is paid, the companies charge their clients at least $100. That is called wage theft. That's called theft of wage labor. That is not meritocracy. When the CEO of one of India's biggest companies hands over the company's reins to his son, that's called uh, nepotism and dynastic, uh, uh, in, that's called inheritance. That is not meritocracy, not even by the farthest stretch of imagination. Who are the top IT billionaires of India, what are their antecedents in terms of which communities do they come from? What were the financial conditions of their, uh, for the, their parents, their grandparents, etc.? Has it come out of nowhere? Trade rights are not applicable to them only when it comes to paying salaries on time and paying bonuses and respecting the existence of workers. There is a phenomenon which I mentioned that I'd like to come back to again and again, that the caste class phenomenon. You claim it to be a meritocracy. I have often asked um, IT firm managers in the personal capacity that why don't you, you there is this massive rejection of the caste-based quota system which exists uh, in, the in the government sector. The private sector en masse rejects it, but the IT sector is vociferously rejecting it at all times. I have often asked that, what are you so scared of? I like to use a term they use. They say, if you have nothing to hide, uh, you shouldn't be worried. That's what I tell them. If you have nothing to hide in the payrolls of, uh, of your company, why don't you con conduct a caste uh, census? Why don't you conduct a gender census? Why, don't, why doesn't Google, even Google abroad, you know? In India, we have the caste equation. They have the color equation over there. Google flatly refused on multiple occasions to conduct a racial uh, analysis or audit of their uh, employees. Why? Because there are hardly any black programmers over there. Why don't you conduct a, a gender pay gap analysis of how much you're paying the women and how much you're paying the men? 
Why don't you tell us all about this if you have nothing to hide? So the entire discourse around except political exceptionalism is a very convenient argument that we want all the benefits that exist, that, that come of the existing setup, the system, the, the corrupt, the uh, bias, the one-sided system, but we don't want to be subject to those little aspects which have been won over years and years of struggle. There is this very, uh, I'm sure at a later stage somebody will uh, talk about uh, censorship and all of that issue. You know, there is the, the, the question of exceptionalism takes a very important, a very uh, interesting uh, dimension when it comes to these major, major corporations. Have you seen how Facebook has come up with a list of, oh, see, India has asked us to give all the details of so many people? Oh, we poor chaps, you know, we respect your privacy, but we have to hand over this document. They're powerless, absolutely. Google is powerless when it comes to censorship, we're fighting censorship against the government. We can't do that, you know, there's a law which says we must help maintain national security. There is equally a law which says you must pay taxes in this country. That part, in, when it comes to paying of taxes, these companies claim an exceptionalism. They say, oh, we are a transnational, post-national, not even transnational, post-national phenomenon. These, these ideas called taxes and etc., uh, etc., et don't apply to us, you know. We could sell in, Flipkart could sell in uh, India, have an sell in Delhi, have an office in Bangalore and bill, uh, make, do the billings in Singapore. Amazon could sell billions of stuff all across the world and not pay taxes and get away with it. And to add insult to injury, they'll actually make this entire construct of exceptionalism saying this is pure trade. This is pure uh, libertarian utopia that we don't need to pay taxes. Another way of bringing these myths which the IT uh, industry has built around itself is by, you know, uh, following the old adage of falena porichiyate, let the, the, the fruits show the trees, something like that. I don't know the English uh, version exactly. You know, let it prove itself empirically. Has it really proven itself empirically? I don't think so. You know, the Facebook phenomenon of violation of, I mean, they're there. Why are they so off from blogging? They can't. So what do they do? Like all true, pure, uh, free market uh, libertarians, they then change the rules of the game. They said, oh, the free, the internet itself, so as to make it generate profits for me. What, what is this? What is this uh, that is happening? Uh, Google also similarly. In fact, Google giving free email, there is no such thing as free email. You cannot have, you need electricity and you need resources and you need software to run those email servers. Google has a model in which they say, we'll give you free email. That doesn't make them money. So how do they make money? Then they start ratting on us uh, and they work on behalf of the government. They have to make money. So what's happening here is contrary to the brilliant brains which the IT industry claims for itself, they have turned out to be idiots of the first order who haven't got a business model working for them. And, they, and, and with this entire fiction which they have built around themselves to preserve that fiction that we are the most intelligent, the most, you know, we are God's gift to humanity, they are transferring, they are pushing all their troubles onto our shoulders. Bad internet, bad connections, bad, uh, we keep talking about bad connectivity. You should really go into the uh, business economics of bad connectivity. Bad connectivity makes as much money as good connectivity does in India. You must really go into that aspect. You know, you will see that these companies, these, uh, the, the entire IT conglomerate, it makes money of the troubles that exist. So far from the utopia which they claim to lead us to, they are actually feeding off all the rot, the cesspool that exists here. Uh, this forum that we are holding here, this, uh, this, this workshop, I think is a wonderful uh, beginning and not more, but it's a wonderful beginning because we need to pull down these Elysiums which the IT moguls have built for themselves. And we need trade rights activists, we need feminists, we need uh, Dalit rights activists and all manners of uh, 
people who speak about the rights of the larger masses or the greater common good, they need to come together and they need to say, no, the internet and everything must hold itself accountable to us, uh, to us as in to these, uh, the, these common principles of human rights which we have evolved over the years. And uh, there is, I think this, this, this forum provides a very good starting point for that. And this confluence of different kinds of rights comes together very well. Lastly, one, I think this has already taken a good uh, turn in that direction, but lastly I would like to point out that, you know, the Magna Carta has been mentioned a couple of times in this uh, program since the morning. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee, the guy who is supposed to be, the fa is said to be the father of the internet, and he was the chief ideator and uh, architect of the internet. He said, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Facebook, Yahoo, Google, and all, you know, the PRISM partners uh, snooping on behalf of the five eyes, he said, the internet needs a Magna Carta. I was very impressed, very good. A lot of people are impressed, but I also would like to add that the internet doesn't only need a Magna Carta, it needs a Paris Commune. It needs to be reminded that liberty, equality, and fraternity are not negotiable. No matter what exceptionalism is claimed by you, these are hard earned, hard won rights which humanity has collected in the past 70,000 years of its modern man has collected in the past 70,000 years of existence and we must by all means stick to it. I, with that I end. Thank you.